Um, so, uh, hello everybody. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Turbal and Jegera peoples as the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which we're working today. And I'd like to emphasize that those lands were never ceded. Uh, on behalf of everyone here and the institution for which I work, the University of Queensland, I would like to pay respect to the Turbal and Jegera peoples, their ancestors and their descendants and their cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society and stand with them in solidarity. And I'd like to extend that acknowledgement to the traditional owners and custodians of the people of the lands from which you join us today. And uh, speaking of solidarity, if you're joining us from the other side of the dateline, uh, happy May Day to you. OK, so welcome uh, to the third lecture in the 2023 Plants, People and the Law lecture series. Uh, one of the aims of the lecture series is to bring together personal historical reflections from some of the most important figures working on plants, people and the law over the last 40 years. Another of the aims of the lecture series is to showcase some of the best work happening currently in this area. Uh, we've been running for two years now. Um, you can find the details and recordings of last year's lecture on the lecture website. Um, you can also find there the details of the final lecture in this year's series uh, coming up next month, and I do hope you can join us. Uh, a couple of uh, quick points of uh, housekeeping. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please post them in the Q&A section, um, and we'll do our best to get to them at the end of the talk. Um, and if for any reason the Q&A section fails, please use my email address, uh, which you should have with the registration details. Um, so in today's lecture, um, we're showcasing some of the most exciting work currently being conducted on the history of people, plants and the law. Um, our speaker, Today is Associate Professor Courtney Fullylove, and she is joining us from Wesleyan University. Uh, most of you will be very familiar with Courtney's work, and in particular her 2017 book, The Prophet of the Earth, The Global Seeds of American Agriculture. Um, this was a work which caused a great many of us, uh, myself very much included, uh, to think in new and productive ways about seeds, agriculture, intellectual property, culture, and indeed history. In particular, we're very excited to hear today um, more about seeds, um, where they come from and what they embody as material and symbolic resources, and of course, as deep time technologies. Um, I think uh, that's enough from me. So I'd like to hand you over to Courtney, who will be speaking today on seeds as deep time technologies. Thank you ever so much, Courtney. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, and I trust you can hear me okay. Yeah. Super. Always good to check. Um, so I, as I said, I'm, I'm so grateful to be included in this series um, from which I've learned an enormous amount, actually. And I uh, in fact, I, I wondered as I was trying to prepare this talk what I could possibly offer to such an outstanding group of scholars um, and insights, some of whom, as you said, have been working for 40 years to help us understand entanglements of people, plants, and the law. So I'm a historian by training, uh, and yet for the past decade or so, I've often felt an interloper or at times a mercenary in the trenches of science policy and law in relation to seeds and plants. And this is mainly because of labor that I've dedicated to collecting expeditions lodged in nationally and internationally managed gene banks, which are the very same institutions that I've spent time trying to understand as a historian. And now and again, I talk and write about those experiences in a variety of collecting projects in the Middle East, the Caucasus Mountains, and Central Asia. But as I consider the outlines of this series, I've begun to see the benefit in going back to roots as a historian, 
not even in terms of the archives that I've used to talk about the development of agricultural research and development in the US, um, but rather much more fundamental questions about how we construe meaning from change over time. So here I should confess something that I think makes it quite difficult for me to do my job well, which is once I've considered an issue, articulating it seems a reiteration of things that are so blindingly obvious that it's embarrassing to say them out loud. But then in teaching and elsewhere, I'm increasingly convinced of the utility of saying blindingly obvious things together over and over. Um, I find it almost has a ritual effect, like a liturgy. And actually, I think that law has this quality too. It's a collective recitation of sacred text reiterated in different contexts across time and space, but then by and for whom, with what power, to what effect. And to that point, I'm not sure it's a good thing that many of our conversations about the ownership of seeds and plants have taken on an almost liturgical redundancy in the false binary rendered between products of nature and objects of property. As Jack Kloppenberg um, said in this series, um, everyone becomes a pirate in what's, what he referred to as the balkanization of the genescape. There's something very calcified about this conversation and the legal frameworks devised to manage the materials of agricultural systems, be they patents, copyrights, licenses, multilateral and bilateral trade agreements. All of them seem encumbered by this binary or reverse engineered from it. So I think law is an essentially historical definition and that it relies on precedent, but also on narratives about the past. So I think one way of disrupting these recursive practices is to consider the histories that have served as the basis of our legal devices. If our received histories in this talk, Stories of Agriculture, no longer stand up to scrutiny, it's worth considering the ways in which new methods and modes of inquiry may suggest alternative ways of organizing life by which I mean seeds and plants and human social life in relation to them. So my persistent hope is that better history can, in the long run, provide a better basis for legal systems. To that end, my plan is to talk about what I mean by deep time technology, to give a brief overview of three different stories we tell about plants and people in the vein of historical materialism, ecology, and actor network theory, and then I'll discuss the last 30 years of revisions to theories of plant domestication and whether the, our new stories of origin for agriculture can serve as the basis of better legal frameworks. That is, whether a revised study of the long history of agrarian knowledge can yield different ways of knowing about seeds and plants that resist their reduction to products of nature or their conscription as objects of property. And so I'll ask for your indulgence, I think, um, for a back to the basic sort of talk that perhaps has few, if any, eureka moments, but is nevertheless an attempt to remember again and again the ways we inscribe our own experience and knowledge of the world in ways that restrict our collective pasts, presents, and futures. Those inscriptions are the subject of the final chapter of my book, The Prophet of the Earth, The Global Seeds of American Agriculture. In that chapter, I offer that seeds are best regarded as deep time technologies, which is to say that seeds are objects of millennia of multi-generational and collaborative labor and knowledge. So I invite you to think with this photograph, where did this come from? Um, I took this on a collecting expedition in the Pamir Mountains uh, that was co-sponsored by the International Center for Agricultural Research in the Dry Areas, ACARTA, in the CGIAR system, as well as Ag Research in New Zealand. Where did this come from? A farmer gave it to us. Um, if I were teaching, I would sort of invite you to tell me what you see, but we can't really do that here, and so I'm going to make just a few observations. First, this isn't a single type of seed, but rather an assemblage. Um, and I think there's a set of postulates that follows um, from, from that assemblage. Um, so first, this, the wheat and rye in this mix is sown with a variety of legumes, which promote nitrogen fixing and long-term soil health. In the farm, farmers preserve seeds in situ, regenerating them from year to year and managing their diversity through varied modes of cultivation and exchange. These are natural, seeds are naturally self-replicating organisms and nevertheless, they require human stewardship and intervention to make viable food supplies or support textile production, for example. That is, neither the seed itself nor the broader assemblage 
represented here, exists without purposeful human intervention. The labor and knowledge that constitute the technology is joint and inseverable in that seeds compress millennia of evolution and the human endeavor required to support it. So lastly, following from this assemblage, the deep history of agrarian knowledge is the foundation of all subsequent interventions to preserve and improve seed, including the celebrated breeding projects of the 20th and 21st centuries. So a second set of observations about this, um, after which I'll move on, is about what the technology is here. And I would argue that the technology represented is the process of selection and assembly. It's not a machine. So broadly, I understand technology as an int intentional tool use. We tend to think of tools as stone, iron, and bronze used to describe the archaeological record, for example, or their mechanized successors. But of course, tools may also be embodied processes. Now, there's some ironies here, one of which is that uh, the seeds in this mix, this is the same bag, were sorted out back in the Tajik National Gene Bank in Dushanbe to allow for classification and physical storage and reduction to data. That is, the technology itself, in this case, has to be disassembled to make it legible in taxonomic and molecular genetic terms. And here's an image of uh, the gene bank in Ikarta and um, back when it was in Syria, or is still, in a sense, this is the medium-term storage. So. Seeds are deep time technologies, fine. That's as fine as far as it goes. But there are a lot of procedural and legal and ethical questions that are implied by this claim. For example, what are the best processes and institutions to preserve or improve seeds? Who should control access to seeds and plants? Who has the authority to give them? Should seeds and other biological materials be owned? How are improvers of them compensated? Whether or not there's a human manager in an ecosystem, what about non-human agency in reproducing and diversifying seeds? So in the short term, I think these debates over credits and benefits sharing and the development of improved varieties emerged in response to the shortcomings of international plant genetic resource policies that were devised in the context of the Green Revolution. In the medium term, most of our legal, legal frameworks for thinking about technology pertain to industrial property, premised on property rights and invention, rather than notions of tradition or stewardship or collectivity. When novel species of IP have tried to bring these categories under a legal umbrella, they've tended to flatten or deny change over time. Why is that? I think we should give that more attention. I would argue that it's not just a quirk of the post-war politics of international development, but rather the histories in which those politics and models of development were rooted. So I think we should ask, how our histories have relied on certain sources, how they've elevated certain actors, and what their core assumptions are about human development. What are our received histories of agriculture? So here, bear with me. Um, I sort of tread into Marx and Engels, uh, uh, sort of, yeah, I, I brace myself as I do this, but I, I do it for a reason. I would argue that historical materialism and the 19th centuries of ideology and progress it supports remains the most durable framework for thinking about change over time and the role of human knowledge and tool use in modifying environments. The earliest critics of capitalism, who were also among its first theorists, interpreted agriculture as one configuration of land, labor, and capital with primary emphasis placed on the labor systems governing production. To the extent that the material components of agricultural systems were discussed, it was as static inputs or resources prerequisite to production. Neither Marx nor Friedrich Engels, who devoted substantially more attention to agriculture, considered in much detail the ways in which the seed itself was already an artifact of production. So I, um, I'm quite attached to this metaphor of table turning that serves as the basis for Marx's theory of commodity fetishism. Um, but when I think about seeds, it gives me pause because tellingly, um, the metaphor uh, in question is of non-embodied tools acting on inorganic matter, the act of table turning. Um, that's a pretty standard rendering of technology um, as it is then industrialized. I think in the absence of a corollary metaphor describing agricultural processes such as simple mass selection, we end up with something akin to Jack's beanstalk, a magic seed, usually prized for enormous yield. Um, and it either has unknown origins or in the case of modern breeding programs, it's credited to one heroic breeder. 
and sometimes both at the same time. Um, hence the myth of the Green Revolution as an effect of miracle seeds. Um, and those miracle seeds as the breakthroughs of a one individual or a group of individuals. So that particular model of innovation is quite well suited to property rights. Marx theorized enclosure, or enclosure and primitive or primary accumulation as the process by which peasants are dispossessed of the land they've worked for millennia. This process provided the wealth prerequisite to capitalist development. And I think these concepts remain a foil for the majority of debates over ownership and improvement of seeds and plants. And again, I would note that the primary focus here is on the expropriation of land from the peasant and of the peasant's labor, not agricultural inputs such as seeds. Although Marx may have acknowledged nature is transformed by human labor, he tended to regard biological material as a natural resource to be tapped for development. And to me, this constitutes one of the primary deficiencies of capitalism's early critiques to divide development into a resource grab and industrial phase, disregarding the forms of technology that were concealed by the former. Our contortions to frame separate legal categories opposing indigenous or traditional knowledge to industrial property rights and invention derive from the false binary between primitive accumulation and industrial development. This general absence of attention to collective knowledge production has led to a very truncated understanding of seeds as commodities, focused less on, them, less on their making than on their commensurability and susceptibility to financialization. In turn, economists have tended to regard seeds. Pardon me. In turn, economists have tended to regard seeds as static inputs in agricultural systems, rather than as dynamic technologies. Marx's teleological renderings of history would influence a wide range of thinkers, including the archaeologist V. Gordon Child in his formulation of a Neolithic revolution in the 1920s and 30s. Child attributed human civilization to the invention of agriculture in the ancient Near East. Such accounts of human development privileged moments of rupture and revolution, reading Euro-American civilization as the apex of all history to date. Marx and Engels viewed enclosure and the agricultural revolution as the prerequisites of industrialization and proletarianization. They were quite critical of recent developments in agriculture. And I would say that in fact, the persistence of the crises they identified, soil exhaustion, overuse of finite resources, rural outmigration, collectivization of farming and so forth, have prompted very regular reference to their theories of productivity and common use. Maybe most, um, notably in this case in relation to theories of the commons promoted first by Garrett Common, uh, sorry, by Garrett Hardin and, and repudiated quite forcefully by Ellen Ostrom. Um, the broader point I want to make here is that this historical shorthand in reference to enclosure and primitive accumulation and the notion of the commons leads to a number of different distortions. To cite just one, Seeds collected for capitalized plant breeding are figured as a commons within a system of multilateral seed sharing. Uh, one could argue that this anti-historical rendering of the commons, in fact, sanctions persistent accumulation for further commercial development and property rights regimes. Um, in other circles, there's a tendency to simplify or idealize the commons with land managed by communities providing a romantic ideal, one in which I one which I think disregards the feudal context described by, by Marx and Engels. More generally, historical materialist interpretations of agriculture create reductive categories of technology which tend to undervalue peasant knowledge and restrict agency to human actors. Nevertheless, historical materialism remains the dominant framework for understanding human social change within a natural environment. But at least since the mid 20th century, these accounts have come into question and I'll briefly take up two approaches in the natural and social sciences, ecology and the sociology of science. So first to ecology, um, uh, the environmental historian Donald Worcester has Wrote and be, written beautifully of um, the history of ecology within a Euro-American tradition. Uh, and he notes at the outset that ecology has become, as of late, one of the more important words to conjure with, and that those who discover it often seem to think they've discovered a new nature, another world of meaning, a way of salvation. But as he knows, it's been the world word ecology and the approach has been around a long time. Um, 
we can begin arbitrarily in 1866 with Ernst Haeckel's uh, concept of ecology, and yet he drew substantially on Linnaeus, Humboldt, Darwin. Nevertheless, his focus on ecology in some ways is um, prototypical of uh, the 19th and 20th century development of the discipline according to the study of the relation of living organisms to the external war world and to one another. Uh, the Danish botanist Evgenius Varming uh, picked up on Heckel's notion of ecology, um, focusing to a greater extent on commensals, symbiosis, and parasitism, um, or the, um, the uh, I think, regarding symbiosis as, um, as an ideal that all nature imperfectly reflects. And this is, again, sort of drawing on um, Daniel Worster's uh, wonderful history. Um, interestingly, in the mid 20th century, as biology becomes more specialized and 19th century traditions of natural history wane, ecology emerges in, as an integrating outlook. And it's in this climate that American botanists such as Arthur Tansley, Henry Calls, and Frederick Clements, among others, forged a school of dynamic ecology focused on the successional development of plant communities. So Clements argued that all vegetation is essentially dynamic. According to his theory, all biota developed through progressive differentiation and integration towards higher cooperation, arriving in their mature form at a climax community. And he argued that all plant communities progress towards this form. As Daniel Worcester has so powerfully described, however, the Dust Bowl of the American Midwest in the 1930s was a violation of these principles, whereby an American romance of social evolution clashed with the platonic models of ecological evolution forged um, by Clements and others. And this violation forced a confrontation between human economic and ecological change that was never fully resolved. So Clements argued that community ecology, a landscape perspective, and the social sciences could moderate human-managed ecosystems. Systems, but the results, and especially in relation to the Dust Bowl, were piecemeal and technocratic. Unlike an ecosystem, an agricultural system is structured by economic rules. And 20th century ecologists never fully addressed whether economic and ecological principles could be held in balance. Agroecologists, since um, the mid to late 20th century, explicitly try to resolve this paradox in the study of interactions between plants, animals, humans, and the environment within agricultural systems. So such an approach takes into account plants, animals, soils, and climate, the impact of human management of the ecosystem, microorganisms such as viruses and fungi that operate quite without regard for human interests, and climatic factors such as drought, cold, and so forth. Whether they take a prescriptive or a descriptive approach to agricultural systems, agroecologists apply the basic insight drawn from ecology that organisms coexist and compete in their shared habitats, and that human beings are but one element in this assemblage. Activists of agroecological methods promote sustainable agriculture as an alternative to global commodity cultures and consolidated models of farming that support them. So in effect, the core problem of agroecology is whether any ecological or biological framework can be compatible with an economic one. And I, I should note in passing that I think another of the unresolved tensions within ecology as a discipline is whether ecology is fundamentally holistic or whether it tends towards instability. And I actually think the recent sort of um, buzzword of resilience and emphasis on resilience um, indicates a tendency towards the latter, but perhaps more on that um, another time. Okay, so I want to take up just one more approach to how we how we think about human beings in their natural environments and change over time, and that's um, actor network theory as it emerges from sociology of science um, from the 1980s. So this is one more approach to the history of human plant relations that decenters humans um, and this one emerges um, not from the natural sciences, but from the, from the social sciences. So since the 1980s, sociologists of science and technology have encouraged us to think of objects and non-humans as invested with their own agency, constituting networks of actors that decenter human power and intention as the primary movers of history. And for these, for these thinkers led by STS scholars such as Bruno Latour, all objects in human-made and natural worlds exist in relationship, 
And only by first describing each object symmetrically and mapping their relations to one another, can we understand the production of knowledge. This approach to object-based epistemologies and non-human agency uh, has um, uh, been picked up by scholars in, in many fields, including organizational analysis, informatics, economics, um, political uh, theorists and philosophers have called for a new materialism, um, a call to which I'm broadly sympathetic. And the insights of actor network theory have also inspired uh, anthropologists of science and technology, as well as multi-species ethnographies that are critical of mechanistic trends in biological science and hopeful of the possibility of imagining justice in ecological rather than narrowly human social terms. So here I'm thinking of Eben Kirksey, Stefan Helmreich, Elaine Gahn, Natasha Myers. To some extent, these approaches challenge the fundamental claims of ecologists that organisms coexist and compete in their shared habitats, and that they don't ascribe any one behavior to objects within a network. Um, I think this suggests that some of the ways in which they're um, politically and perhaps morally and ethically somewhat agnostic or at least malleable. Um, nevertheless, actor network theory inspired histories of biology have also tended to be quite critical of its institutional and methodological development. Um, to take one example, um, Natasha Myers, both in her work on plant sensing and protein modeling explores the persistence of lively methods within, within scientific cultures that have come to idealize mechanistic metaphors of life. Chief among these are reductive representations of molecular genetics, which offer the possibility of rendering all life as code. So critics charge that these methods misrepresent the complex interactions of genes and environments, for example, and produce reductive renderings of life that are suited to the imperatives of biotech to engineer new life forms. It's with a little bit of uneasiness then that I want to turn back to the tools of molecular genetics that have dominated the late 20th century biological sciences to revisit our stories about the origins of agriculture and the human knowledge that supported it. For me, it's striking that just about everything we know about the origins of agriculture, the who, what, when, where, and why of history, seems to have been revised in the last 30 years, upending our received wisdom about the invention of agriculture and the cradle of civilization. As the historian of um, Bruce Kuklick has suggested, the scantiness of data made it easy for generations of scholars to deploy grand narratives about how civilizations rise and fall, hence um, Marx, hence um, V. Gordon Child, also um, social theorists of social evolution, such as uh, Lewis Henry Morgan, the American ethnologist. So in the 19th and 20th centuries, these were primarily stories of violence and war. And as Bruce Kuklick suggests, uh, it's only since the 1960s that scholars have come to uh, emphasize themes such as economic reorganization, ecological pressures, gradual social change. And in the study of agriculture's origins, I think these revisions are largely attributable to changes in sources and methodology. So studies of pottery and lithics or stone tools dominated 19th and early 20th century accounts of domestication in the ancient Near East. Since the 1990s, however, the methods of molecular genetics have been applied to problems of domestication, including te techniques of um, um, molecular, molecular fingerprinting and phylogenetic analysis, um, et cetera. So perhaps ironically, these insights come into focus just as these same methods have been subjected to scrutiny as tools of the biotech industry. Um, I think this in spite of the fact that many domestication researchers um, view their project um, as a pursuit of uh, crop domestication that's unbiased by breeding methods that suggest simple pathways of domestication um, based on deliberate selection and hybridization. Um, the most recent students of plant domestication weigh up phylogenetic analysis against archaeobotanical evidence, searching for missing pieces and unstudied assumptions about evolution and human choices and natural constraints. So 
everything, the who, what, when, where, why is, is different than the uh, old chestnut of children's textbooks, um, uh, the Fertile Crescent, the Cradle of Civilization, um, with which I imagine many of you were raised as well. And I was, I, I say, I pulled my undergraduates earlier, by the way, uh, seeing being as how they were born after, uh, uh, oh my Lord, born after 2000. Um, but I think the, these narratives that we have of the invention of civilization are, are quite sticky uh, because it was quite, I, I found that the narratives with which I was raised um, were quite similar uh, to uh, the ones in which um, uh, they were fluent. So rather than go who, what, when, where, why, let's back up and perhaps go uh, in reverse. Why, where, when, what, who? Um, so why? Recent studies of plant domestication have emphasized the role of climate and other exogenous factors in constraining human choices about food production. Higher temperatures, more precipitation, and more CO2 in the post-Pleistocene period increase global populations of plants and animals, including human beings, creating the conditions for maintenance of stable plant populations. So Andrew Sherritt has referred to this post-Pleistocene warming in its local context, not as a Neolithic revolution, but rather as a forager climax. That is, gradual sea level rise and forest growth created new ecological niches, contributing to the emergence of dense populations of foragers. Near waterways, this mixture of foraging and hunting promoted sedentism and trade. In Western Asia, these movements ultimately linked to the northern end of the Levantine Corridor from the Jordan Valley and the Middle Euphrates to the foothills of southeastern Turkey, across the Anatolian Plateau and onward towards Cyprus. An interacting network, as he puts it, of forager communities linked in a set of interlocking circuits. So here in this slide um, from a, a different publication, um, you see a sort of new map that's provided of domestication and early agriculture in the Mediterranean basin. And you can see the location of colonist farming enclaves um, shown in the red um, ellipses. Um, so you see um, the red dots that have been settled by colonist farmers, um, the blue dots where um, colonist farmers have integrated with foragers, and green dots indicating where indigenous foragers um, remain dominant but adopt elements of a Neolithic package. So I think this is um, really quite a stunning map and just indicating the sort of broad movements over, over space that constitute some of our, our new pictures of domestication. But as to the what, which food plants warrant attention has also been brought into question with a focus shifting from a few cereal crops to a much broader range of plant assemblages. And these findings have um, shifted investigations away from um, cereals and grasses towards legumes and tree co crops. So lentils, chickpeas, figs, for example, receiving more attention in recent decades. Moreover, while settled cereal cultivation originated in the Near East some 10,000 years ago, archaeological evidence indicates that um, the gathering of wild emmer wheat uh, extends to 90,000 years ago. Um, so that suggests, uh, suggests that human beings collected wild grains for some 10,000 years prior to domestication. In other words, human beings appear to have been modifying local ecosystems and manipulating biotic communities to increase the availability of certain economically important resources for thousands of years before the morphological changes we identify in plants uh, that indicate domestication. Okay, so why, what, where? Contemporary research rejects the notion that agriculture appeared spontaneously in any single location. Archaeobotanists have found evidence that domestication occurred in multiple parallel events across a wide region throughout the early Holocene. For example, einkorn wheat, emmer wheat, and barley were all likely cultivated and domesticated multiple times across a broad area from southeastern Turkey and the Levant to the Zagros Mountains in modern day Iran. So there's no one single core of original agriculture. And by extinction, pardon me, by extension, domestication was less a discovery than a series of strategic economic shifts that took place in many parts of the world. So these inc include cereals in Southwest Asia, but also Chinese millets from 6,000 BC as earlier before rice in multiple regions of China. Um, they also include numerous mid-Holocene domestications across Sub-Saharan Africa, including African pearl millet in the Sahel, um, 
independently of its simultaneous cultivation in Southeast Mauritania, um, sorghum in the savanna region between Lake Chad and Ethiopia, and the Amazon peanuts uh, were cultivated by 7,000 BCE on the Peruvian coast long before the arrival of maize and other crops through the central, Amaz through the central Amaz Amazon. So um, where are we? Why, what, where, who? Uh, well, Dorian Fuller and his co-authors extrapolate that there was no one prime mover that globally caused human beings to farm. Rather, um, and further, there's no reason to believe that sowing and tending of plants was the great idea of a few core foragers of the early Hyl Holocene in the upper Tigris Valley. But instead, it was shared ancestral knowledge of Homo sapiens, which could be drawn upon as local circumstances warranted. So, and it follows that new sedentary communities would have benefited from the persistence of wild resources and from their continued association with, foraging for, with flourishing forager communities. And I think that for me, again, is what this map really indicates so beautifully is the extent to which uh, a culture of hunter-gathering um, persisted with early domestication. But here, agriculture emerges not as a great invention or as a cradle of civilization, still common to children's textbooks, but as a minority response to the ecological conditions of the early, early Holocene, to quote Andrew Sherritt. And it's not just that molecular genetic evidence makes the identification of domestic thresholds increasingly difficult. It also suggests that such a line of inquiry is unproductive to understanding the process of domestication itself. Understanding why and how human beings shifted to settled cultivation requires not so much a story of innovation as one that accounts for multiple push and pull factors in what seems to have been a plural piecemeal process of domestication. That is, we need more nuanced explanations of the logics of domestication and innovation, as well as a more historically contingent understanding of how such processes became normative and pervasive. Um, so I think further, uh, perhaps this is obvious, but in this image, there's, there's nothing inherently superior about settled cultivation as a food system. Um, certainly not anything to justify its association with civilization as a positive good. In fact, viewed in broader terms, the caloric boost precipitated by large-scale grain cultivation can be considered an energy transition comparable to the shift to fossil fuels, rapidly expanding the human population at the expense of ecological stability. So in this context, the legacy of the Neolithic revolution looks rather different. So. Let's then revisit our object of deep time technology um, to make a number of points. I would return to my original question. Where did this come from? Like you can answer that question in so many different ways. Um, but it strikes me that there's an ongoing dispute among agronomists, breeders, and genetic resource curators about the extent to which the provenance of seeds matters. And implicitly, whether practices in agriculture or biodiversity management or plant breeding require any historical consciousness? Does the history of these seeds matter? Okay, so it's no surprise that I would answer with an emphatic yes, but also with a footnote, which is to say what kind of history? And here I, I'm showing you um, an intermediate stage in the reduction of this seed to data um, after it was collected in the field, but before it was disaggregated in the gene bank in Jushan Bay, uh, the process I showed you at the beginning of the talk. Um, so you can see a number of things about this seed. You can see that it's TJK11, that means the 11th mission to Tajikistan, which is already sort of interesting when you consider that it was only really possible for international organizations to collect into Tajikistan after the fall of the Soviet Union in 1992. So this would have been in 2011, which means there were 10 prior missions. You can sort of learn a lot from this tabular data. You can see that the accession was entered as Sakale Seriale, that is rye. But you know, looking at the picture, that it also contained wheat and chickpeas and lentils, among other things. Um, so it's interesting that somebody eyeballed this and um, considered the primary seed to be rye. 
we don't know, or at least I don't remember. I don't remember whether that was based on eyeballing what was in the bag or asking the farmer what the primary crop was. And it's interesting too, that that didn't make its way into the database. Um, we can see some other things that this was collected in the Gorno Badakhshan region of the Pamir Mountains, um, uh, which um, yes, was in Tajikistan, but this is a region that borders Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Iran. Um, and uh, so the politics of which nation state we're talking about also become interesting. We can see the region, we can see the village, um, the Suhan village. Um, um, but uh, the only notes entered here are that it's rye out of a bag of um, seeds, a mix of wheat, rye, faba bean, lentil, given by the farmer. Um, so that's quite, quite a reduction already. And you know that once it's taken apart, um, in the gene bank, then I can't remember whether the, the lentils were saved, whether the wheat was saved, or whether only the rye was saved. If the latter were, then they would have their own exception. So um, let's look at my picture again. Um, where does this come from? What kind of history do we need to talk about this object? Well, the technology is already an assemblage, as we discussed at the outset of the talk, but it doesn't make sense without reference to a number of other things. Um, the mountain region from, from which it originates um, and the steppe um, at its foot. Um, the Pamir Mountains are one of Vavilov's centers of origin, prized um, for their isolation, um, for their preserve of local varieties. Um, so the assemblage doesn't make sense without um, the geography and topography. It doesn't make sense um, without the Pond River bordering Afghanistan and without uh, this rusted tank that you see um, on the hilltop over the river, um, collecting was only possible because of um, the particular uh, history of this post-Soviet Republic, which um, actually was substantially weakened by civil war in the 1990s um, in the aftermath of which international agencies um, became more active, both in aid and in development. So you can't make sense of the collection of this assemblage without the tank. You can't make sense of it without the driver behind the wheel um, or uh, uh, the guy with the donkey on the side of the road who gave us directions. You can't make sense of the seed without the pastoralists and the farmers um, and the drivers who tell us where to go um, to find the technology. You can't make sense of it without understanding how it's milled and how it's stored um, in the village in which it's produced. Um, or for example, understanding how it was threshed, um, which is usually in common on a roadway with the other um, crops in the village. And then a portion of that seed would be saved from season to season. Um, and so this itself is a, a part of the process of mass selection that forms the technology. And you can't make sense of the seed without understanding uh, of the technology without understanding the way in which it was reduced to data. And here we have the, the data officer from ICARDA, um, Jan Knopka, um, speaking to um, a woman in the village uh, from which the sample was collected. You know, they would have been speaking Russian um, and Jan was Polish and uh, her mother tongue would be a Pamiri dialect. Um, and it's only possible for them to communicate because of her education uh, within the Soviet Union and uh, Jan's um, knowledge of Russian as well. And so these multiple layers of translation and mediation and reduction, whereby knowledge is recorded and made data are an essential part of this history. All of that may seem uh, like contemporary history, like ethnography, and I suppose that's true, but I would add to that, that we need to focus on the temporality of seeds uh, to understand our primary assumptions about technology, about technology and the material and human agency um, from which it's derived. So here I would say that deep time extends not simply to the 10 to 12,000 year vantage, uh, vintage of plant domestication, but rather to uh, the selective management of wild stands and, and plants long preceding and succeeding those movements. 
So the changeability of our stories of origin should suggest revisions to our concepts of innovation. But I think this is where we get stuck. How can we make sense of a history without progress, without civilization? What would a story of origins look like that denied categories of civilization and commodity? Can plants think uh, teach us to think differently about human history and about change over time? Um, and you know, here I would just say that um, I think this is sort of a funny moment because with all of our heroic agency in some ways uh, reiterated by the idea of the Anthropocene, um, nevertheless, human beings are at the tail end of a deep con time continuum. And so it follows that we should be able to regard seas as evolved prior to human intervention and take plant sentience and agency seriously as creative and life-sustaining forces. But nevertheless, I think these are places in which we get stuck. Um, and I, I just wanted to um, uh, offer a few um, last things by way of um, conclusion. Um, I would say there's a contradiction between asserting that all organic life is self-organized and then insisting on a robust framework of farmers and plant breeders' rights in managing and modifying them. Um, this contradiction, I think, emerges quite naturally from a dual commitment to the commons and ecological principles, the former of which are indebted to historical materialism and the latter of which unseat human agency as primary. Um, but I worry that trying to have it both ways, insisting that seeds and plants are self-organized systems, and, and then also insisting on a robust framework of rights to protect farmers, is likely to fail by way of internal contradiction. And thus, I would argue a more judicious approach is to reconsider our vantage of technology in light of studies of deep time and the long history of human landscape management before and after domestication. It seems to me that modes of reasoning derived from ecology and actor network theory have become dominant in both scientific and social scientific disciplines, but that our policy vocabulary is still stuck in an intellectual tradition of historical materialism. So how do we fashion legal tools that model ethical commitments to interdependence? That's sort of my question. And I think it's too big of a question to answer here, certainly. Um, but I would say that we can begin with reference to histories of it interdependence. And so I see this, this historical inquiry as a supportive one. Um, with respect to questions of law and power, I think we can do better than to argue about whether things are technological or natural objects in either ontological or sociological terms. I would say that to do so in historical terms provides a better basis to deconstruct and possibly reconstruct property forms, some of which I think we've already heard about in this series. So for me, it is in these more broadly defined materialisms, not simply social and technological organization, but also the depth and persistence of human and non-human interdependence that we can locate new ways of making and sustaining life. I will stop there. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Courtney. That was fantastic. Um, and I think uh, we can maybe raise a round of applause virtually for you, um, and I can literally. Um, that was such an evocative talk, so rich um, and full of so much. You said something at the beginning about restating obvious truths. Um, I think your obvious truths are operating at a, a far higher level than I am. Um, it's going to take me quite some time to unpick um, my responses here. Um, I suppose... Um, while we're waiting for people to send questions in through the Q&A. Um, my initial response, um, and I hope it's not very underformulated, but um, it's to think of the comparison with um, Darwin's work on evolution. Um, so on one particular view, what Darwin does is takes Lyell's sense of deep time and applies it to the biological. Um, and so does a new world in which we conceive as biology as uh, uh, deep time um, emerge after Darwin? Um, no, it doesn't in the slightest. And in fact, um, the, the young earth creationist movement, um, you know, comes along very much later. Um, so I was wondering, what does the deep time, um, that new temporality do for us? How might it shift the uh, the dial on practice? Um, what sorts of resistances? Um, I like very much the the notion of the sticky narrative of the fertile crescent that you um, alluded to. Um, so, um, if you'd like to comment, yeah, I, 
Uh, thank you. Stuff. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Deep time is something that sort of gets picked up in selected context, and then it's not really clear um, how it can make us think differently um, in, in the day to day. But I think in some ways it already is making us think differently. It's just that, that as I try to suggest, I think there's a lag between um, the different sort of venues and vocabularies that we have um, for talking about change over time. And so, you know, I think ecologists um, and sociologists, uh, sociologists all have the best sense of time sometimes, but uh, <laughs> they, um, uh, like I think ecologists certainly have, have been thinking in, um, long time frames for for quite a while now um but it simply hasn't translated into um frameworks for uh reconsidering um human agency um in practical contexts and so you know I've, I've sort of um if we were to sort of take a more broadly defined materialism that uh, would tend to undercut notions of property and invention um, and heroic human agency. It seems to me it goes in one of two directions. Like it either goes in um, plants should have rights, like non-humans should have rights. And we've had this movement in animal rights for a really long time, right? W but with limited traction. Um, and there are philosophers working in this vein. I'm thinking of Michael Martyr at the moment. Um, so either it goes in this direction where all non-human agents also deserve rights um, or it sort of undercuts the rights framework entirely as simply a, a wrong-headed approach to organizing life. Um, and I think the latter is the more radical tactic and also the much more difficult to realize. And uh, so, um, you know, rather than keep all you poor souls here for another 10 hours, I would just sort of, you know, stop it there for the moment and just say that, you know, I'm not I'm not a policymaker and I'm also not a prophet, but I um, as a historian, I think um, it's sort of it's a little bit irresponsible that we're trafficking in these um, like too tidy narratives of um, these sticky narratives of progress that we all know are kind of wrong, but we continue to use the same vocabulary that reproduces them. So like, how can we start to use a different vocabulary as historians to keep from just reinscribing these categories of objects of nature versus objects of property? And um, the commons itself, which, uh, you know, I mean, I didn't talk about this in great detail. Um, you know, I, I, I think Ellen, I'm not going to go toe to toe with an Eleanor Ostrom. I mean, she's brilliant. Um, but I just think the, the entire invocation of the commons, um, first in its sort of um, slightly despicable um, rendering by Garrett, Harman's, uh, Garrett Hardin, and then in its repudiation as a sort of um, more ideal principle that can work um, on a local level. I just think in either case, like why are we stuck on the commons? This is not this is not helpful. Like these, the very idea is derived from um, sort of categories of enclosure and accumulation that have some pretty fundamental flaws. Um, and I don't think we all walk around thinking of ourselves as Marxists. Uh, we're all Marxists in a way um, because we're indebted to those models of change. And so we'd better do a little bit more to understand the ways they're over-determining our thinking um, about how we organize um, the social life and ecological life. Thank you so much. Um, we've got uh, a question from uh, our colleague here, Hamish MacDonald, um, and one I would like to uh, append uh, something to the end of. So um, he asks, uh, could you expand a little more on the internal contradictions you see in plant intellectual property and how this might lead to the system's failure? Um, and I would like to append that a note on intellectual property even more widely than just plant intellectual property. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, I'm going to share my screen a minute uh, again, if that's all right. Let's see Please if I can do. get this back up here, uh, because I realize, oh, that's not it. Let's try this one instead, um, because I realize there's uh, something else in that vein that I wanted to um, to mention. Just this um, brief uh, clip, um, the preamble to the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. Uh, on farmers' rights, so affirming the past, present, and future contributions of all farmers and um, of farmers in all regions of the world, particularly those in centers of origin and diversity, in conserving, improving, and making available these resources. Uh, this is the basis of farmers' rights. It seems to me that itself is um, quite plain about the contradiction um, that the basis of farmers' rights is that um, their their products are part of the commons. <laughs> um, uh, I'm not even sure it's a contradiction. I think it's kind of, it's a bit of a hypocrisy. Uh, it simply doesn't work. 
Um, and so, you know, I, I'm, I, I sort of wrestle with everyone else um, about the best way for um, these um, systems, be they sort of multi multilateral accords um, or um, property rights and invention to remake themselves. I mean, on one hand, we have um, sort of Vandana Shiva embracing the commons. On the other, we have um, Jack Kloppenberg and others saying we need to get on board with the copy left movement and move towards open source seeds. Um, I think you know there, there's sort of a version of this, and what is which is like let a million flowers bloom. Like I, uh, I think all of these are, um, including you know, uh, in many of the other um, uh, programs suggested by speakers in this series, um, there are ways we can continue to tweak and reform and fight with um, these structures, um, but. I think you know all of us are quite aware of the fact that they're the products of um, of I guess to begin with a, a global history of capitalism that develops from the 16th, 16th century forward at least, and also with legacies of imperialism and colonialism that produce these very institutions um, uh, that are governed by these multilateral accords. So it's um, I think there's a sort of reforming process which is quite healthy, um, but I. And I'm not saying that um, necessarily these um, institution practices, institutions and practices will come apart, um, but I do think they're hobbled by their contradictions and their pursuit of a more just, um, uh, a more just arrangement with reference to either human or non-human actors. Um, Thank you so much. Um, I suppose, my uh, inclination is to say, does this not put pressure um, on the idea that, um, so as soon as one gets serious about the ontology of innovation and where new things come from, uh, the idea of individuating the rights associated with that innovation comes to seem rather difficult to maintain. Um, and so does that mean that we, um, if we want to keep hold of um, a, a system of intellectual property that operates somewhat uh, um, as the one we now have does, um, have to just be more honest about its economic purposes and strategies. Yeah, perhaps. Um, I, I think also, though, um, you know, we can seek ways of organizing knowledge and resources collectively. Um, I just think when we do that, it can't simply be as a foil to private property rights and invention. Um, I, I think, you know, the sort of purpose of this very brief historical tour was to suggest that when we've tried to take seriously collective knowledge and um, its stewardship over time, uh, it's actually gone quite badly um, in terms of, um, you know, it's sort of romantic attachment to the commons um, and its very notion of tradition, um, which seems to deny um, uh, collaborative labor, um, collectivity and change over time. And I think we can do better um, in that regard. Um, we can think about knowledge as co-produced by human beings and by human beings and non-human actors. Um, we can think of plants as intelligent. Um, so I think that, um, you know, there, I, it, the sort of how we deal with um, property rights and invention and the sort of series of um, systems and accords that have developed around those is one question. I think for me, at least maybe the more interesting question is how we um, theorize um, and um, understand um, collective knowledge production by humans and non-humans. Um, and uh, I think that that's really a, a sort of a productive and an interesting project um, in thinking about how we uh, decenter human beings and elevate um, forms of agency that aren't so anthropocentric, uh, even in the Anthropocene. <laughs> um, I'm just looking to the questions to see if we've got anything from anyone else. Um... Nope, everybody is still thinking. Um, it really was such a, a rich and evocative talk, but um, I'm looking forward to reviewing the video so I can draw back out of it many of the things which I only half glimpsed as you came past them.
Um, hmm. just, uh, my own interest. <laughs> one that. I will say like, I have yet to ever give a talk, not once where someone hasn't said very rich talk. I have some thoughts about that category, <laughs> but I'm just going to, I'm going to embrace it. <laughs> so uh, for my own uh, kind of research inclinations, what I would like to hear some more about is the symbolic um, meaning of seeds and the symbolic weight that they bear. Um, and so, you know, um, they, they make for great sloganeering precisely because they seem to be things that we know the identity of and the significance of. Um, but, uh, you know, upon closer inspection, those significances and identities fall apart. Um, so uh, is this the end of seeds as symbolic slogans? I hope so. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't get me wrong. I love seeds. I think they're um, wonders, you know, and the more I learn about them, the more fascinated I am by their complexity. Um but, uh, you know, I think my my sort of attachment to the commodity fetishism stuff is precisely this, that if um, the symbolic uh, story we get is this is a miracle seed and either we have no idea how it's so wondrous or it was made by this one um, brilliant breeder who crossed X, Y, and Z, then in either case, we've we've got a problem. That's just sloppy thinking. So you, you can think um, a seed is a wonder and... Um, acknowledge what's wondrous about it, that um, it's not really a product of nature, that yes, it's a self-directed system, but it exists um, by virtue of continuous human stewardship and intervention that um, that goes back for, for the, that extends millennia. And so I think, you know, in an era where we can't sort of have enough institutional memory to seemingly carry something forward 10 to 20 years, or even uh, from one academic year to the next, to me, it seems stunning that we do have knowledge systems that are that durable um, and that we managed to denigrate so successfully because of their failure to leave certain kinds of uh, records. Um, so what does, it, what does that mean about us um, as historians um, um, or as storytellers generally about the world um, that we are so... Uh, wedded to sort of elevating certain kinds of sources and certain actors that um, we make things into mysteries, uh, which aren't mysterious, but wondrous, you know? Mm. So, yeah. Thank you. That's, yeah. Um, I see uh, Dan has a hand raised. Uh, so I think if I ask you to unmute Dan, um, you should be able to take the microphone from us and ask a question. Can you hear me? I, I have a new... Um, video system. Okay. Courtney, nice to see you after all this time. A brilliant talk. Um, I want to uh, goad you a little bit by asking a question that the uh, agricultural capitalist would immediately raise about the perspective you bring to this topic. If you uh, insist on acknowledging the Multiple, the rights of multiple contributors to the development and raising of seeds, uh, then uh, the, uh, the, investor, the investment community would say, uh, or the defenders of the investment community would say, where do you expect then to get the capital that's required to uh, pursue uh, or generate these developments? This is not a, a question uh, to uh, advance the interests of the capitalist, ag capital agriculturalist, but to simply ask where, how you see this in your analytical scheme. I guess I would say that, um, yes, certainly they would say that, um, but the process um, through which they have gained access to both the material inputs for breeding and the primary knowledge used to produce it are, um, in essence, uh, expropriated. I mean, my, you know, my, my first book was largely, uh, you know, follows Jack Kloppenberg in a sense. And understanding the ways in which private industry built on gifts of the state, um, some of which were in the form of publicly produced research and the patent office and universities, uh, land-grant universities and agricultural experiment stations. 
and in the form of biological material, um, improved seeds that were collected from uh, across the world. So uh, I don't have any doubt of the, the claims that um, agricultural capitalists would make for um, their need for a certain form of seed capital, as it were. Um, but I think that as historians, we know that that industry is, is based on um, uh, gifts of the state and on expropriated uh, material and knowledge uh, at a global level. Um, so, I mean, I guess as a historian, I don't see my task as sort of um, trying to either um, justify or enable the capitalist basis of agricultural development, but simply to point out the mechanisms through through which it um, took its current form. Um, and yeah, I think sort of reckoning with those is the kind of work that we need to do to build um, more just um, systems. Right, but in saying that's unsatisfying. That, I don't know. I'm sorry. I said, if you, yeah. if you're, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, did I interrupt you? Did you want to say more? Uh, in in saying, uh, I mean, calling attention to the, your aim of uh, building a more just world, and certainly uh, an aim that uh, most of us would agree with. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the so there is an agenda. Uh, you're not just calling attention to something. There is an agenda uh, of, of equitable, more equitable distribution of returns, let's say. Uh, and it's true that all, all you point out, you, all you point to of the uh, uh, ingredients uh, that enable the capitalist uh, to do what the capitalist does uh, are all there. But let's say the capitalist is not there because you want to... Uh, um, externalize, uh, I mean, internalize uh, the returns due to all those other uh, uh, players in the game, both historically and, and, and contemporary, the contemporary world. And the capitalist says, fine, do it. I'm not going to invest. Yeah, well, I mean, so I you think- You gotta get the resource from somewhere. What do you envision? I, I, I think quite simply, I don't. I mean, I think your slip of internalized versus externalized is actually quite telling here that, in effect, um, you know, capitalists and economists, capitalist leaning economists have externalized a number of costs for quite some time. Um, and right. that's actually what needs to be that's actually what needs to be explained. Um, so what are what are the possible outcomes of that arrangement? I mean, that I don't really consider it within my my bailiwick to to decide. Um, but I think, you know, I, I sort of, I guess I would make no apology for sort of, um, for acknowledging an ethics. Um, I think, you know, an ethics that's based on acknowledging histories of interdependence is also good history. Um, I think an ethics that's based on obscuring those histories, um, is also bad history. <laughs> um, and so, um, you know, I, I I think in in effect we're maybe saying the same thing, um, but I you know I think the the broad history of capitalism has externalized environmental costs for years, and with what outcomes? I mean, do we really consider it our jobs as historians to um, try and keep sticking the thing together with um, scotch tape and glue um, such that we can continue in the same old ways when we're kind of driving the whole species and then some off a cliff? Like I. You know, I don't think that those are. Um, I don't think that those are uh, useful commitments. Um, you know, yeah. So, <laughs> um, in a way, I, I think we're in lockstep on this. It's simply that um, with a somewhat different program. Thank you. Thank you both. That was um, a really interesting exchange. Um, Courtney, we've, we've kept you right up to the hour and a little bit beyond. Um, so perhaps now's the, the time to draw a close for the talk today. Um, I'm looking forward to reviewing the video, as I said, and hopefully um, I'll be able to send you a lot more questions to follow up. Because, um, um, yeah, this is a talk which will be with me for quite a long time, I think, um, in my own struggling to try and think about these subjects. Um, Thank you so much for uh, including me. I've, I've really learned a lot from the series and um, uh, and I appreciate being able to watch the recordings after the fact when the time don't, doesn't work for me. So thanks. <laughs> Thank you.
And thank you for sharing so generously with your time and your thoughts with us today. Um, it's really been wonderful. Um, I think we can muster another uh, virtual uh, round of applause. Um, and uh, a real one as well from my colleagues in the room too. And thank you again for me. Cheers. <laughs>